Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture. My name is Zulan, and I am a fourth year undergraduate completing my degree in mechanical engineering. I am also a campus ambassador here at UC Berkeley. Thank you to all of our guests for joining us today, and a huge thank you to all of our donors. We all benefit from and are immensely grateful for generations of your support. Before we begin, here are some important housekeeping notes. Please note that we are recording this event. We are keeping the audience muted to minimize background noise. Please use the chat feature to post questions to our speaker. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Megan Hochstrasser is the Education Program Manager at the Innovation Genomics Institute. Megan earned her BA in biology from Brown University and received her PhD from Jennifer Doudna's lab at UC Berkeley in 2016, where she studied natural CRISPR systems. She joined the Innovative Genomics Institute to bridge the gap between researchers and the public. As a CRISPR expert and professional science communicator, Hochstrasser brings diverse audiences into the conversation about genome editing. Please join me in welcoming Megan Hochstrasser. Thanks everyone. Thanks for that nice introduction. Great to see you all. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about CRISPR. So this is a, a new genome editing tool that lets us rewrite DNA and with it potentially the future of humanity. So uh, as uh, Zuan said, I work for a group called the Innovative Genomics Institute who, and we're located at UC Berkeley. Um, our vision is to make a world in which these genome editing tools that we've developed here at Berkeley and, and in other places are actually used to benefit humanity and that they're actually accessible. So we put a lot of emphasis on both research and also outreach and thinking about equitable distribution of new therapies, products, et cetera. Um, and as I said, we're located at Berkeley, but we're actually a partnership between UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco. And we also fund projects at UC Davis, particularly on the agricultural side of what we do and at other places in the Bay Area. So the idea is sort of to bring together all kinds of researchers um, in, on the West Coast to, to solve some big problems. And at, I do education and outreach for IGI. Um, so I work with all kinds of different students, um, even Sometimes little kids will come to some of our events. I have I run an undergraduate course about CRISPR that perhaps you know you, you have some connection to um, that's every summer at Berkeley. So I do all kinds of things like that. And my mission is really to make this content accessible to people. So I'm a scientist by training um, and I've learned how to speak science, but I, I think of my role as kind of being a translator of science into plain English. Okay. So let's, let's talk about science. Um, normally, if we were in person, I would ask if anybody knows what I'm showing here. Um, you can yell it out to yourself wherever you are, if you know it. But this is DNA, or an artist's depiction of DNA. So this is the blueprint of life. This is this molecule that's present in every one of our cells, um, except red blood cells. Fun fact, if the DNA gets ejected from red blood cells as they mature. Um, so the DNA encodes proteins and proteins are like the little molecular machines that go throughout your cell and do all the tasks that the cell needs to survive, replicate, grow, etc. Um, so DNA is very important. And for a long time, there wasn't very much we could do about the DNA in our own bodies or in, or in animals and plants. We couldn't alter it. If there was a mutation, um, we couldn't do the advanced experiments that we would like to do to sort of understand how it works. Um, but CRISPR is letting that is changing that and letting us do a lot more in the lab. So that's what I'll talk to you about today. So just to kind of review, this is probably stuff that we all learned a long time ago in, in high school. Um, but uh, I think it, it's nice to sort of review why DNA is important. So the, the main thing that DNA does is it controls traits. And traits are characteristics about a person or an organism. So I've just stolen these examples because they're kind of nice from 23andMe. These are types of traits that you could test yourself for and see how likely you are to have them, even though you probably know whether or not you have things like dimples or if you like cilantro. Um, but it, it could be kind of interesting to see 
how those things that seem like your personality or preferences really come from this genetic code within all of your cells. So these are just some examples of traits. Um, and while these are sort of frivolous and fun, there are also traits that are really not so fun. So you could have mutations in your DNA that cause particular diseases. So on the right, I've taken just a very small sampling of the genetic diseases that 23andMe tests for. Um, and there are actually thought to be thousands of different genetic diseases. Um, some of them are ultra, ultra rare. Some of them are more well-known like cystic fibrosis shown here. You've probably heard of before. It's one of the more well-known genetic diseases. Um, and whichever one of these someone has, they you know, deserve an option, a treatment option, um, even if they're one of the only people in the world that have that condition. So that's why that's one of the reasons why CRISPR has been so exciting because we finally have this option to try to fix some of those mutations and potentially do it really broadly for people that have even rare conditions that a drug company is never going to go after because they can't make a drug and sell it to just one person at a time. And so I'll, I'll briefly kind of go into what CRISPR actually is and how it works. Um, and that'll be sort of the first half of my talk. So if you don't like molecular details of things, I'm sorry, but it won't last that long. But I know some people in the audience really want to understand the nitty gritty details of how these things work. So what I'm showing you here is a CRISPR molecule called Cas9. Um, that's just one CRISPR protein. That's the main one that does this genome editing process. And that's shown in green. So that's the Cas9 protein. And the way that it works is that it's uh, guided by something we call the guide RNA that's in gold here. This is a piece of RNA, which people now tend to know because of the, the COVID vaccines when people previously had no idea what RNA was. So it's basically a, a, a single stranded piece of nucleic acid, meaning it's similar to DNA, but it's just one strand. And we actually can change the sequence that's encoded on this guide RNA. And that tells this Cas9 protein in green where to go. So we say, here's a sequence of RNA, go find that matching sequence in DNA. And so once that Cas9 molecule finds that target site where we've told it to go land, it makes cuts through both strands. So it pulls apart the DNA, the double helix, you can see that in blue here, and makes a cut across each strand. And that initiates the, the, the editing process. So making a cut in DNA kind of causes changes later on. Um, so that's sort of an overview of how CRISPR works. I really like to show this because I couldn't believe that this video existed, but this is actually uh, an atomic force microscopy video where you can see this in action. And this is very, very tiny, like ultra, not even microscopic at, at some point, like a regular microscope you could not use to see something like Cas9 because it's so small. Um, but this particular technique lets us see it. So I just wanna play this briefly. So this is Cas9. You can see that the DNA is kind of bent at the same angle as in the diagram. And we're gonna watch it cut the DNA. So I was blown away the first time I saw this. I probably gasped. Um, so you can see uh, the, the protein. If you actually, if you're a, a protein nerd, you can see some changes in the shape of the protein that's setting this in depth, but I just like to show, look, it cut the DNA. Okay, so how exactly do we program Cas9? So I kind of went over this quickly, but I'll, I'll explain it in a little more depth. Um, so first you have to know the target. So imagine you'd like to correct something like cystic fibrosis. Whoops, mouse is out of control. Um, you have to identify the mutation that you're trying to go after. So let's say there's a mutation in this blue segment. So we'll choose this as our target site in the DNA. Then uh, we have to design the guide RNA that will tell the Cas9 or CRISPR protein to go to that site. So there's half of the guide RNA shown here in gray that's all kind of knotted up. That doesn't change. That's basically like the handle that the protein holds on to. And while it's holding onto that handle, we can, uh, it, it'll always hold on to that. And it doesn't care if we change this piece of the RNA that's shown in blue. So the scientist, as scientists, I can just go onto my computer. I can order one of these guide RNAs. I could also make it in the lab. There's multiple ways to do it. Um, but either way, as long as I give Cas9 the guide, it'll know what to do. And what that is, is it'll go into the cell once we add it. 
um, and it'll base pair or form a double helix with its target as long as these are two complementary strands um, and it'll make a cut. So that's how it works. It's sort of like a GPS code that you're, you're giving to this molecule and telling it where to go cut in the genome. And so you might wonder why is making a cut in the genome going to edit DNA? Like, doesn't that sound like you're just destroying the DNA and making situations even worse? Um, yeah, it's sort of counterintuitive, but what this does is that it triggers DNA repair in the cells and DNA repair can change this underlying sequence of the DNA. So this all starts with a tool like CRISPR or other gene editing tools serving as sort of like molecular scissors to make a cut through double-stranded uh, double DNA, which is also called a double-strand break. And this sends the cell into panic mode. So if you have a bunch of cuts like this in your DNA, the cell is going to die um, unless it can fix them. So all of our cells have all of these different repair pathways and mechanisms in place to detect when there's damage to the DNA and go try to fix it. So this type of break can trigger one of two main repair pathways. So in one case, the, the cell's repair machinery kind of does a slapdash job. It sort of just like slaps these two ends of the DNA back together, sews it up, and it might end up kind of deleting some piece of DNA that's hanging off. It might throw in some random nucleotides um, and it ends up disrupting that sequence. So that might sound bad. Um, if you're trying to cure a disease, you probably don't wanna like randomly scramble someone's genetic code. Uh, but this is actually really useful for research purposes. So if we're trying to understand how a gene works and what it does, a really good way to know what something does is to break it and see what happens. Like if you were, if you didn't understand what brakes did on a bike, if you rip off uh, the brake lines and it can't stop anymore, you can make a guess that the brake line probably had something to do with being able to stop the bike. So we can do the same thing in biology and there's all different labs on UC Berkeley's campus and elsewhere that use this tool to understand really interesting things about the natural world. Um, I think I'll mention some of those later on. The other pathway that can be triggered or that we can encourage to happen that's more useful for trying to correct a mutation or, or treat a disease uh, is in, uh, involves adding a piece of DNA. So we can design this such that we make a cut at the mutation that's causing the disease and then add in a piece of healthy donor DNA. So this will encode the correct sequence or the sequence that we want to have included. And this sort of tricks the cell into pasting this into that gap, um, kind of like patching over the gap with the piece of DNA that we've provided. And in that way, we can either replace something that's here originally or add in something totally new. Uh, and this pathway is a lot harder to get to happen. So I think people kind of, one thing that is a misconception about CRISPR is that we're tightly controlling everything that happens. Um, in reality, we really just control making this initial cut and don't have as much control over what actually happens after that. So that's kind of a, I would say a long-term direction in the field is trying to control the outcomes of gene, genome editing and make sure that we're just getting the types of edits that we want and not something else. Okay, so I have a little video that hopefully can sort of summarize everything I've, I've told you in a visual form. Um, and hopefully you can hear this, but somebody let me know if you can't hear it. Oh, I think I'm, I must have removed the sound. Okay, we're diving into a cell. Um, and this purple protein is Cas9. So there's gonna be a bunch of proteins all searching around all of the DNA looking for their target. And this next one's gonna actually find the target. So this Cas9 is going to hop on and sort of sample this DNA and see if it will base pair with its guide RNA. And you can see that's kind of an interesting process where they wrap around and look, there's a match. So it's gonna make a cut through both strands and then repair proteins or other proteins are kind of going to displace Cas9, push it off, and make a change at that site. So in this case, there's these two pink uh, genetic letters or nucleotides that got inserted um, when the repair protein tried to seal the gap that Cas9 made. So 
in that way, we can uh, add disruptions to the sequence to knock out a gene, or which I'm not showing you here, if we added a piece of donor DNA or template DNA, we could insert a healthy version of a gene instead. Oops. Okay, so this was made by a, a really cool molecular animator named Janet Owasa, who has done a lot of really cool COVID stuff and HIV animations, all sorts of interesting things you can check out if that's up your alley. Okay, so this is sort of my summary, no more molecular talk um, slide. So if you don't understand RNA and that was too much for you, it's a kind of okay. What you really need to know is that CRISPR lets us change DNA in living cells and organisms. So I like to give a little bit of an analogy here. We can imagine a gene sequence is a, you know, a sentence like this. And in red, we have a mutation. This shouldn't say twinkle, twinkle, battle star, unless you like sci-fi, um, but we can use a technique like CRISPR to try to change that sequence um, to the correct to the correct line, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And so because of this analogy to text, um, sometimes we'll call this like genome editing and compare it to text editing, like imagine going into a Google Doc or Microsoft Word document and just making a change directly to a DNA sequence. It's sort of like that. Um, or you can also think about it as a genetic surgery. So going in with a really, really tiny scalpel and changing DNA around fixing things, replacing things. So both of those analogies or me metaphors, um, I think can be useful in trying to conceptualize this, but whatever works for you, go with that. So just remember that CRISPR is a way to rewrite DNA. All right, so why is this such an advancement? Um, you might have heard of other genome editing tools that predate CRISPR, and there certainly are some. Um, the, the two kind of main ones that I'll talk about here are zinc fingers and talons. So that's these two things shown in this diagram. Um, I won't get into this too much, but the key difference here is that with prior tools, you had to change a pro the protein itself to make a change at a new target site. Meaning um, these little, everything that's shown in orange is the thing that you have to change to, to make this complex go to a new place in the DNA. Um, and engineering a protein is difficult, like protein engineering is its own field. Whereas in with Cas9, all you have to change is an RNA. So the protein in blue stays completely the same and you just load it with a different guide. So that's super easy. That's not hard at all. As I mentioned earlier, you can literally just type in whatever RNA or DNA sequence you want into various sites on the, on the internet that provide these. And I could type this in and get this shipped um, to my building like two weeks from now or one, one week from now in a little tube. So it's really, really easy to work with this. Um, it's cheaper, it's faster. It's basically a user-friendly genome editing tool. So I was in the Dowden lab when this kind of came out um, here at Berkeley. And within like two years of it, I would say most of my friends on campus who are working in other labs were already using this tool because it's just so easy to pick up uh, and so useful. Okay, so if we can edit something, sorry, if something has DNA, that means we can edit it. And one of the definitions of an organism is that it has DNA. So this means we can make changes to any organism that we want, and that's a big advance. So what I'm showing you right here is a handful of what we call model organisms. Um, so that's things like mice, Arabidopsis, that's the plant, fruit flies. And these are organisms that we've been able to study for decades and decades because for whatever reason, um, they have a simple system for manipulating their genetics. They're easy to work with in the lab. There's a lot of um, work that's gone towards making them work well in the lab. But there's so much more diversity out there on earth, of course. So with CRISPR, we can actually edit anything. And everything I'm showing you here has actually already been edited with CRISPR. And I'll tell you, I think I made this slide like four years ago or something. So since then, many, many more things have been edited. So we can now do experiments to understand all sorts of aspects of nature. Um, one of the things I love to highlight is editing butterflies. There was a, a lab on campus a while ago that actually moved, unfortunately, um, up to the East Coast, but they studied 
butterfly wing patterns. And so they would knock out genes and see how that impacted the pattern and start to learn how these really beautiful intricate patterns are actually controlled by genetic pathways. So I thought that was a, a super interesting example. Um, but there's so much that we can learn. And you know, as I said before, this has really become a common research tool. Um, I think one of the most exciting things we can do with CRISPR is to potentially treat genetic diseases. I think most people are very excited about this prospect because for a long time, your DNA was sort of set in stone. And if you had a mutation that caused a disease, you could potentially treat symptoms, or in some cases there are transplant options that are curative. But in this case, we finally have a tool that can just go in and correct the underlying mutation that's causing the problem. So a lot of the initial work um, towards using CRISPR in humans for in a therapeutic way has gone towards sickle cell disease specifically. Um, you may or may not be familiar with sickle cell, but it's a disorder cause, caused by a single mutation. So out of all of the DNA uh, in people with sickle cell, they have just this one letter that's mutated to a different letter. Um, and that's enough to cause this really severe disease. So it makes it an appealing target for CRISPR because it's really well understood how this one mutation leads normally circular healthy red blood cells to become sickle shaped or crescent shaped. And then they get stuck in the blood vessel and it causes damage and pain and it's really awful, but it's really well understood. So we can potentially use CRISPR to make a cut and insert one of those pieces of donor DNA that I mentioned to replace this letter with the correct one that should then let somebody make healthy red blood cells. Um, and this is something that we're working on here at the IGI. There's several other people working on this as well using um, similar or sort of different strategies, but all using gene editing. And it has shown really, really incredible promise in early testing. So we're all still at the stage of doing clinical trials, meaning this is not an approved treatment that's available to anyone. We're just doing small confined tests to small groups of people to make sure that it's really safe. Um, and then eventually just see that it's effective before rolling it out to everybody. And so there's a, a prominent story uh, that NPR has been doing following this particular sickle cell patient shown on the screen, Victoria Gray, who's volunteered to kind of let her journey through this trial be, be shared. Um, and she had really severe pain crises. She needed transfusions. She was having a really difficult time with her disease. Then she got this CRISPR treatment and she hasn't needed transfusions. She doesn't have pain crises. It seems, you know, knock on wood, curative, right? Um, and I, I don't like to say that she's been cured for sure, just because, you know, this is so early. We do need to track people for long periods of time and make sure you know, we didn't, they didn't cure her sickle cell, but then also give her cancer or something like that, you know, long-term side effects can develop. Um, but this was a really, really promising initial development. Um, and there's been similar data, I won't go into all of it, for a number of different diseases as well. Um, we've summarized this in this annual update that we now do on our website um, to kind of give you a sense of what's, what's out there, because it's a handful of very specific diseases and they all have different things that you, you should think about and what to look for, I guess. So if you're curious about that, I encourage you to just check that out on our website for updates. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do with gene editing, of course. Uh, like I said, some of the things I, I mentioned probably sound exciting, but there's probably things you wouldn't want scientists to be doing with genome editing. So this sort of technology brings up a lot of questions about what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and so there's, I'm just putting this little thing here that it's supposed to indicate a GMO. So that's like a, a topic that a lot of people get upset about. There's a lot of controversy associated with genetically engineering foods. Um, CRISPR is a different technology than the, the prior, prior ones. And it's technically in a regulatory sense, it's not considered a GMO, a GMO product if you use CRISPR necessarily. So it is distinct, but it brings up some of the same questions about, you know, what people, do people want to know what's in their food? What is the a level of risk that people are okay with? Um, how should it be regulated? Things like that. Uh, there's also, I can't get into all of these things, but 
there's this concept called a gene drive that could potentially wipe out a whole species of mosquitoes using CRISPR, um, which sounds appealing if you want to get rid of malaria, which kills a horrifying number of people every year, but could also have ecological consequences. If you're just removing a, a piece of a food web, um, things could happen that are unexpected. So that's a kind of intriguing one to think about, an intriguing application to consider. And then last, I think the, the main focus of most discussion about the ethics of using CRISPR revolve around using CRISPR for human editing in the germline, meaning in, in uh, sperm, eggs, or embryos. So these are, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this because it's um, sort of the, the hottest topic on, on the ethics front. So this concept of human germline editing uh, involves usually uh, we talk about the potential of doing the CRISPR editing while you're doing in vitro fertilization. So that's what I'm showing you here. This is an, a still of a, an IVF procedure where an egg cell, this circle is being held in place and then a needle or a, yeah, a needle is being used to inject sperm directly into the egg. So imagine uh, you also include, instead of just the sperm, you also include those CRISPR molecules that I was talking about. Um, in that way, you could end up making changes in this embryo as it's you know, a single cell um, and then developing into a full embryo. So why does that matter? Why is that an ethical conundrum? Um, there's a real difference between editing somatic cells, meaning everything but the germ cells in a body, like in Victoria Gray and other you know, sickle cell patients, in that case, you're editing their blood stem cells. You're not editing cells that are going to be used for reproduction. And so that means that those changes are not heritable. So if something goes wrong or something isn't desirable in a later generation, it's not going to get passed down. It's going to live and die with that one person. Whereas if you were to edit germ cells or an embryo, that would be heritable. Those changes ostensibly will be present in every cell in, that, in the offspring's body. Once that baby is born, all of their cells should have that change if it was made at that one cell stage because that cell divides and creates all the later cells. Um, and that means that that offspring's germ cells are also gonna have this change. So when they have their own children, they're gonna pass it down. So that means Essentially, by doing germline editing, you're potentially altering the course of human evolution itself um, and, and could change people in the long term. So this, this inspires a lot of ethical questions. Um, I think they can be lumped into a couple of categories. So there are technical risks for whatever reason in this context, things don't seem to work as well as they do in other ones. So there seem to be more unexpected DNA changes as, as a result of using CRISPR. There could be things like off-target effects. That's what I'm showing in this little diagram um, where the CRISPR protein cuts somewhere that it shouldn't. Um, and if you're doing this in an embryo, you, the technical risks are kind of magnified because instead of just affecting a handful of cells, they're affecting an entire person potentially. So if, if anything goes wrong, um, the consequences are probably greater. There are also, of course, philosophical considerations. Um, different religions will have really different viewpoints on this. Individual people will have different viewpoints. And then there's the societal impacts to consider. So this could become something that's very expensive. So IVF is already tends to be you know, expensive and is not done that often. Um, and to add something like this on top of it could become a lot more expensive. And you could imagine this sort of stratifying social classes even further if certain people can enhance their kids or avoid disease and other people can't that could be problematic for the, our society uh, and then this is kind of preposterous but is meant putting the hulk here is meant to signify that we could make sort of superfluous changes to people as well so you could imagine downstream parents choosing aesthetic qualities of their kids so not just trying to prevent disease but changing eye color or trying to make them more likely to be musically talented or things like that. Um, and the, the level to which we can predict things like that is extremely variable. So something like eye color is fairly predictable and could potentially be edited. 
something like musical prowess, certainly not. Um, but I could imagine a clinic claiming to be able to do that, which is concerning. This, what I'm referring to is basically this concept of designer babies, where you can pick qualities of a of future offspring ahead of time. And this actually did sort of happen. I don't know if I would have called it designer babies, but CRISPR edited human babies were born in China a, a couple of years ago now. And it was a real horrible situation. Um, the guy who did it ended up going to jail because he forged ethics approvals and really just went about this in a really horribly unstrategic scientific way. So the way he even did it was horrible. Um, and I don't have time to get into the whole thing. So I, I recommend this article on the Atlantic if you're interested in learning more about what happened there. I think that um, Ed Young, who's like an amazing science writer, does a good job summarizing it. Um, but I do wanna say that I think the main takeaway from all of that was that we really need more oversight and we need uh, maybe even like whistleblower options because it came out that a variety of people were kind of aware that this was happening before it did, but there's nowhere to really turn to to stop something like that unless you know for sure that it's being done uh, illegally. And so this has been an ongoing conversation. So back even in 2017, there was this report that came out trying to talk about when it might be okay to do this sort of genome editing, um, if it will ever be okay, what kind of societal uh, engagement do you have to do first, what diseases would be okay to do, what traits would not be okay to edit, et cetera. Um, so that was an influential report, but as you know now, they, it didn't stop this one guy from doing this anyway um, in a really misguided way. So uh, there's also these newer panels um, in 2018, this was established and they've just come out with some new, uh, some new ideas um, for this, which they, they have a draft governance framework sort of released. Um, but I, I like the idea of having these sort of world health organization level groups and, and others um, out there able to consider how we might control something like this across the world, because you, you don't want to have a scenario where germline editing is legal in Mexico and then people from the US go to Mexico to get it done or things like that. That's called medical tourism. Um, we wouldn't want a scenario like that. So I think that's something to consider uh, that these efforts are really nascent though. So I wouldn't say anything is solved, um, but I think that this CRISPR baby debacle that happened really shone a light and told the community, we need to be doing this faster and we need to be more serious about it. So. I'll also add that in the US, it's not possible to do this yet in a legal manner anyway. Um, the FDA will not consider any kind of trial that involves human germline editing. The NIH won't fund any research like that. So it's kind of shut down here at least, but it's, it's inconsistent across the world. Okay, so aside from the sort of scarier possibilities of what people can do with this tool, I like to point out that, you know, a tool is not good or bad by itself. It's, it's up to us to decide how we want to use the powers that we have. Um, and I would say 99% of people in science are using CRISPR for things that are kind of good or, or that we could mostly agree are good. So you can do things, really exciting things in basic research, in medicine, in agriculture. There's, there's so much that can be done. And at this point, the tools are advancing so much that we're really only limited by our own time and imagination. The tools themselves can really change DNA in, in all the ways that we want in increasingly. Okay, so I really recommend if you're interested in learning more, um, there's so much out there on the internet. I, I think it's probably hard to know what's, what's right um, what, or what's accurate to look at, but I do recommend my you know, PhD advisor, Jennifer, um, who recently won the Nobel Prize for discovering or, or developing this technology. She wrote a book called A Crack in Creation that I think is good. It's a little bit older now, but I, it's still a really good summary of the history of the technology, how it can be used, ethical considerations. Um, and that's a great one. There's also a newer book that I don't have on this slide by Walter Isaacson, who profiles um, important people throughout history and recently wrote a book about Jennifer and the CRISPR field called Code Breaker. Um, which is also great. And then if you're more interested in watching information and visually taking it in than reading, 
Uh, I really, really like this documentary called Human Nature, which is on Netflix. It's also available on demand and in other places. Um, and this goes into, you know, the same story, but in a visual, in a visual way. And I think they did a really, really good job with it. So I recommend checking those out. And then our website uh, has all kinds of information on CRISPR. We compile uh, external pieces that we think are really high quality. We make our own. We have glossaries, videos, all kinds of stuff um, on social media. You can get kind of the latest CRISPR news as well. If you want to follow me for some reason, I'm on Twitter at the CRISPRS. I really only talk about nerdy level CRISPR stuff. So probably not, not the right um, follow for this audience, but if you're interested, go ahead. Um, and with that, I would be more than happy to take any questions. Thanks so much for your attention. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, this is incredibly fascinating. Um, thanks so much for guiding us through this remarkable big picture of CRISPR and its implications. Um, so with that, I will share some of the questions from the audience. Uh, we have about seven so far. Um, the first is, how do you get this to happen far and wide in a body to alter someone's DNA for say a cure. Right, so you're actually touching on a really important question. Uh oh, am I frozen? Did I freeze for a second? No, you're good. Oh, okay, uh, you guys all froze, um, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, so this is a really important question that you're touching on, which is how do you actually get CRISPR molecules into the places they need to go in a body, whether that's throughout all the cells or just to some place like the brain, if that's the, the type of disorder you're trying to treat. And that's an unsolved problem. That's actually a huge hurdle between um, what we have now and, and getting to having therapies for all sorts of diseases is that we don't have great tools for getting these materials into the body. So primarily right now, I would say people really rely on viruses for this. So there are things called um, AAV, adenovirus, lentivirus. You might come across these. These are sort of traditionally thought of as gene therapy viruses. And the idea behind them is that all the harmful part of the virus has been taken out, but then you can load in your own cargo. And the virus is really good at injecting DNA into targeted cells. So we have these versions of these viruses that can target different tissues and organs, but there are some downsides to them. Like they, they by themselves can cause a really harmful immune response. They can lead to longer term uh, presence of the CRISPR stuff, CRISPR molecules than we would want. Like ideally you wanna make the cut get out and don't leave the molecule sitting there to cut other places over time. Um, so there's some downsides there. There's a lot of work trying to develop new approaches to, to solve this issue because right now um, we can only treat a limited number of diseases based on the tools that we have. Like sickle cell, I guess I should also mention, sickle cell is one of the initial targets precisely because of this problem. Uh, and it's because we're able to extract blood stem cells from people pretty easily and we can edit them in the lab and then return them to the patient. And that can't be done, of course, for you know lung cells, brain cells. We can't just take those out. So right now we're a little bit limited in the scope of which diseases we can treat until we figure out new ways to, to deliver the CRISPR machinery. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so my next, the next question is, every cell has DNA and we have billions of cells. Do you have to modify DNA in each cell to fix the disease? Great, that's the perfect follow-up question to, to the last one. Um, the number of cells and which cells you actually have to modify to treat a disease totally depends on the disease. So with sickle cell, um, we only need to, to treat the stem cells that give rise to new red blood cells. And in that case, for you know, because of reasons related to how that disease works, it's thought that if you could modify even as low as 5% of those stem cells, that would be enough to have a therapeutic benefit. So the bar is very low there. Of course, we're aiming for much higher than that because we want to have a cure, not a slight benefit. Um, but for other conditions, you might need to have much more efficient editing throughout the whole population of cells in a particular organ or tissue. So it's going to depend. I would say something like um, molecular, uh, sorry, <laughs> my God. 
muscular dystrophy, I could not stop saying molecular, muscular dystrophy is gonna be a lot harder potentially to treat because you have to reach all the muscles, the heart muscle, arm muscles, everything. It's gonna be more widespread. Um, so that's gonna be kind of a harder disease to treat, though there are there's a lot of progress as well on that front. Okay. Um, the next question is, how does the editing know how or what to change to? So in the video, the pink DNA that was replaced to. Yeah, so that process, I, I kind of say it's random. It's not totally random. It can be predicted. But for the most part, we don't really care if we're trying to knock out a gene. We don't really care what mutations are made as long as they disrupt the gene. So I won't get into it in too much detail, but if you know what a frame shift mutation is, basically the way that uh, genes are read is like every three letters encodes a, an amino acid. And so if you deleted one nucleotide um, or one letter, that would change all the downstream amino acids because that triplet code gets thrown off, if that makes any sense. So even just changing one nucleotide, um, somewhere in the middle or in the, towards the beginning of a gene will screw up the rest of the protein. So in that case, we don't really care what happens. Um, and it's, it's, it's a semi-random thing, like the, the cell just repairs it however it can. Um, in the other case where we're trying to do precise changes, in that case, we need to provide the sequence that we want added or replaced. So we would add in a piece of DNA encoding exactly what we want and try to get the cell to insert that piece of DNA or that sequence. Um, and there's also, there's other tools. I mean, I, I could give 700 hours of talks on all these aspects of CRISPR, but I can't fit it onto one. But there are tools called base editors that are newer versions of CRISPR that can edit just a single base at a time in, a, in one direction. Like they can change a C to a T or they can change an A to a G. And that's a much more precise sort of targeted uh, approach to changing things. But again, it, it only does one letter to one letter. So it's not every type of change you might want to make. Okay. Um, so uh, another audience member asked, how do all the cells in a person get the DNA all edited? Would it happen that some cell DNAs are edited and other cells are not edited properly? What would happen then? Yeah, so that's kind of getting at what I, the, the previous questions. Um, I think you can always assume that when you try to edit 100 cells in a dish, not all 100 are going to get edited and potentially not all of them are gonna get the same edit. So as we were just talking about, these repairs can happen differently. So in, if you had 100 cells in a dish, I would say a typical rate of um, getting the, the insertion that you want with that exact sequence could be like, you know, 5%, five, for five of those 100 cells get that insertion. And then maybe 70 of the cells get a random mutation um, that knocks out gene function. And so you're gonna have a mixed population in that dish or potentially in that human. So a lot of the preclinical work goes into maximizing the repair outcome that you want and kind of tweaking the level of things and the approach until you can get really high efficiency, like 90% is getting the insertion you want. Um, and it's thought that for the most part, you know, if you get 90% of the cells corrected, it's okay if 5% of them or 10% of them either don't get corrected or get an additional mutation. Um, but that is a concern. I mean, that's something we have to think about if that additional mutation that you don't want happening has a, a pathological effect, you have to know that ahead of time. You have to kind of predict, is that gonna, you know, you wouldn't want to edit something potentially cancer causing like an oncogene in this way, um, in an uncontrolled way. But for the most part, if it's like sickle cell, hemoglobin, if you further screw up hemoglobin, it's not going to have a, a bad effect as long as you have enough of the correct cells. Okay. Um, another audience member asked about what percentage of the time does the RNA correctly find the right spot on the DNA to do the cutting? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say the vast majority of the time, Cas9 does exactly what you want it to. So it's able to use the RNA to find where you want it to go and make that cut. Um, there are off-target effects, but when we talk about off-targets, then the percentage of the time that you're detecting them, it totally depends, one, on which guide RNA you use. Um, but then two, it's pretty low. It's like, you know, 1% or less often. 
you'll see le levels like that. Or often if you, you know, kind of optimized your system, you could see levels that are like so low, you can't even detect them. Like you can't tell the difference between an off target change and random mutations that always happen in cells. Um, and so again, that, that it all requires thoughtful guide RNA design to make sure that you're not trying to target a sequence that's also present other times in the genome um, and that there's no other kind of similar matches that might trick Cas9 and then testing all these guides and looking to see which one is the most accurate. Okay, um, the next question is how far are we from, oh, sorry. How are multiple cuts used to coordinate replacement of a gene instead of a single cut and addition of a gene? Yeah, so there are all different kinds of strategies for this. So you could even make a nick on one strand in some cases and get insertions of your donor DNA. Um, it really depends on your strategy. There's some where you do dual nicking where like Cas9, you have two Cas9s come in and each cut one strand far apart that can encourage like larger deletions to happen. There's all sorts of different strategies that you can use. Um, the most efficient thing is making a double strand break. So both strands of that double helix getting cut. So there's a full gap in the DNA that's going to trigger the most likely to tr trigger DNA repair because it's such a severe change. Um, but I mean, there's I can't, I can't really answer the question properly just because there's so many different repair pathways and editing strategies out there. Okay, thank you. Um, how far are we from actually using CRISPR technology in the mainstream for mutation reduction or disease reduction? Yeah, so I said before that we're still at, at the clinical trial phase for every CRISPR therapy that's being studied. Um, meaning it's, it's still kind of early days, but this was only even developed in like 2012, 2013. So it's been really rapidly progressing to this point. And clinical trials take, you know, several years. It depends on the nature of the trial exactly how long, but I would say it wouldn't be that crazy to think there'd be an approved CRISPR therapy, like F FDA approved product in like five years, maybe 10 years. But I think there's a big difference between having one approved therapy for sickle cell that nobody can afford and having tons and tons of treatments for any disease that everybody can access easily, right? So there's a, I think it'll be a couple decades before anything is really widespread or broadly available. Um, and I just alluded to the cost being an issue. I think that's gonna be a huge issue with these therapies is, they're really, really expensive and comparable therapies and like called gene therapies that have been FDA approved are like half a million dollars, $2 million a treatment. And theoretically you only need it once, um, but that even then that's still a huge barrier to, towards having this be a really widespread thing. So that's something we talk about all the time at IGI is how can we reduce the cost on the science side? How can we explore ways to make this accessible um, on, on the social side, you know, can we keep, keep it out of a company's hand that might jack up the prices? Can we do it in a nonprofit way? We're exploring a lot of different options. Um, so the next question is, I have the BRCA gene mutation and have had all relevant organs except for my colon surgically removed. Could this technology prevent me from contracting colon cancer, which was my mother's cause of death? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that first off. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I think this is sort of the dark side of having this sort of genetic knowledge is that it's, it's empowering in some ways, but it's also kind of a burden that you have to deal with. And that, you know, that sounds like such a difficult scenario that you've been going through. Um, I've been asked about this a couple of times, actually, from other people that carry BRCA. Um, I think that we're not close yet to being to be using CRISPR in people to prevent something that's not guaranteed to happen. Um, I think that for now, because it's so early and we really don't wanna be you know, using a technology before it's totally proven to be safe, it's more focused on prevent or stopping diseases that are already going to be lethal or very, very harmful to someone that they already have. Um, so I don't think we're quite at the point of doing it preventatively, but that should be kind of one of the next steps in, in what people start, start testing. Um, 
I'm not sure. I think there is potential to do that. If we can find a way to deliver to the colon, which I don't think we have great delivery mechanisms now, I could be wrong. Um, if we could find a way to get CRISPR machinery in there to mutate, you know, to fix that mutation, that would really change the, the risk profile. But again, I think those sorts of things where you're lowering risk and it's not guaranteed are a little bit farther off. Okay. Um, so actually that was our last question. Um, just wanted to thank you again, Megan, so much for sharing your time with us this morning. Um, and just to help enlighten us on this remarkable advancement. And thank you so much for your work. Um, and thanks to all sure. of you in the audience uh, for joining us. Um, we hope you have a wonderful homecoming weekend and please take care. Thanks everyone.